FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome. You are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz at 6220. Well, we just blew through May like it was nothing. And well, hopefully things will start to reopen around the country in June. I can't see it going on much longer, but what do you think? Like to know your opinion? Why don't you send me an email? KL at KerryLutz.com. Well, you know that government corruption, very, very serious issue here and perhaps uh, is not addressed enough. It undermines the faith in government. It makes people less anxious to pay taxes. I'm sure you feel that way, especially when you feel that uh, the government is not representing you and it's following its own interests. Well, we've got uh, John Wisniewski with us now. And John, you served uh, the New York Jersey State Assembly from 96 to 18. You actually were a Democratic Party candidate for governor in 17, and you led the investigation into the Bridgegate scandal, uh, where aides to uh, then-Governor Chris Christie were uh, convicted for closing uh, several lanes in the GW Bridge in Fort Lee uh, in retaliation for the mayor's refusal to endorse the governor for re-election, and those those convictions were subsequently thrown out by the Supreme Court, if I'm not mistaken, just a couple of weeks ago. And, uh, well, what do you make of it? Well, that's a big question. Uh, let's break it into parts, talking first about the United States Supreme Court decision uh, in Kelly versus United States. Kelly referring to Bridget Kelly, who is the author of the, uh, I guess now infamous email, Time for Traffic Problems in Fort Lee, which was the starting gun, so to speak, for blocking access lanes from Fort Lee onto the George Washington Bridge. The United States Supreme Court, Justice Kagan, writing for unanimous court, said that this was not the kind of property crime that the Congress had in mind when they passed the uh, dishonest services statute and therefore undid the conviction that uh, was obtained about two years before. You know, it's uh, on one level, uh, I understand the Supreme Court's job is to make sure that prosecutors, government officials at all level are following the letter of the law uh, as it has been subsequently interpreted. I get that and I accept the decision. But the concern is that the language used by Justice Kagan and accepted by her colleagues on the court says that this kind of deliberate uh, misuse of government authority is okay. And I think that is at its heart, you mentioned it in your intro, uh, part of where people lose faith in government. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. I assume you're an attorney. I'm a recovering attorney, so one attorney to the other. Um, but it wasn't quite that she said it was okay. She just said that it wasn't criminal. So basically, it's up to the voters to, uh, to redress this issue. But corruption in New Jersey is kind of like uh, gold mining in, uh, in Nevada. It's all over the place, and nobody seems to want to do anything about it. In this case, no money was stolen. But we had a case recently where the U.S. Supreme Court said, unless you can show that there's a specific quid pro quo where I pay a public servant to actually do something, just because I shower him with gifts, that's okay. Um, you know, we're talking about billions of dollars. I read recently in New Jersey, there was one guy, he has eight government jobs. He's pulling in $2 million a year. Who's a bigger problem? The people that tie up bridge traffic for a couple of hours? Not right. Definitely. I lived in Fort Lee. I know all about the bridge traffic there. And it sure doesn't need any help from the government. 
but we're really in this sea of corruption. New Jersey has always been a corrupt state, and well, nobody's doing anything about it. New Jersey is as corrupt as just about any other state. The problem is, is we have in New Jersey 1,300 units of local government, and it frankly becomes daunting to have a watchful eye on all of it. And so there is, you know, a problem with the layers of government we have. But, you know, I think it's a slippery slope, and I'm going to disagree with you. You know, we're talking about Bridgegate. We're talking about a deliberate misuse of authority and to kind of morph into, well, somebody has got multiple jobs, and therefore that's even worse. But let's, you know, don't, there's, there's nothing illegal about somebody having those multiple jobs. Uh, maybe there should be. But Eight of them. There's nothing illegal. Eight of them, and bring in two million a year. But look, uh, when we're talking about corruption, let's go back to Menendez because of that decision from the Supreme Court that said there's got to be a direct agreement, a quid pro quo, if you will. He was showered with gifts, trips, everything else. All right, brought up on trial, tossed out on a mistrial, and then the government basically said, we're not going to pursue this case any longer because of the Supreme Court's ruling. And it effectively legalized corruption. And then the, uh, the voters of New Jersey reelected the guy. So if the voters are going to reelect people who've got the odor of corruption, if not the conviction, if not convicted in a court of law by the uh, judicial system, uh, what hope is there? Well, you know, I spent 22 years going door to door, going to fairs, shaking hands, which you can't do anymore. <laughs> uh, you know, talking to ordinary people who we expect to come out and vote. We make our case, uh, as I was for 22 years, an assemblyman asking for people to vote for me. And I was always astonished at the level of cynicism that exists about government, about people who hold government office. Uh, you know, I, I would I would run into folks uh, on the campaign trail, and uh, they would automatically uh, make a statement about, you know, whether it was the car I was driving or the clothes I was wearing or anything, that, uh, you know, somehow it must be ill-gotten gains. And I think that when we look at the state of our democracy today, uh, we have a huge problem that's staring us in the face and we're not addressing it, which is the lack of trust. There was a poll out the other day that only 17 percent of Americans believe that the government will do the right thing. If only 17 percent, that's 83 percent who don't believe government will do the right thing. Remember in our civics lessons as teenagers or as young kids in school, you know, this is government by the consent of the governed. If of the course. people who are giving their consent stop believing that the people they are sending there is doing the right thing, we have a we have a fundamental problem with our form of government and we have to find a way to reconcile it with the realities of today. Uh, and that's that's a tough job right now. I couldn't agree with you more. And when you see the response in the pandemic of sending infected patients to nursing homes to basically spread the disease, cost thousands of lives, and I'm not pointing fingers at particular people. I'm just saying, when you see that type of thing, is it any wonder? The, the wonder is, who are the 17% of the people who believe that the government will do the right thing? You know, unfortunately, uh, I think that the the seventeen percent of the people who believe government is doing the right thing are the probably the seventeen percent who don't really have a need to be concerned about what government's doing. Uh, you know, perhaps you know they they have the ability to you know quarantine in, in manners that you and I don't uh, have to deal with, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, our the world for them is is a pretty cool place because they've got the resources, but. For a lot of folks, when times get tough, uh, historically, it's been government that has at least coalesced folks together to say, let's do this together. Let's fix this problem, whether it was during the Great Depression, whether it was World War II, 
uh, there's been an ability for government to be a force that marshals uh, our better angels. But today, it seems that there is so much division, it's hard to do that. And, yeah. you know, for a country that is based on the consent of the government, go- consent of the governed, we need to do a real soul search. You mentioned earlier the uh, Supreme Court decision in the case involving the governor of Virginia. Uh, mm-hmm. You Correct. know, that, that case, uh, and indirectly uh, the Bridgegate case, uh, says that Congress needs to reexamine these laws to make sure that uh, when you have this kind of, you know, Governor, it was a Governor McDonald in, in Virginia got a car. Uh, correct. Uh, in return for setting up meetings. Yep. Uh, oh, totally corrupt. Just uh, as corrupt if, as if, Menendez. If, Cong- if, if Congress is not willing to address that, then that's where people start to say, well, what are they doing? That's such a great point. And I I don't, I'm not pointing the finger at you and I hope you don't think that I am because I know if you'd like, no, no, absolutely (laughs) not. Because looking at your record on Wikipedia, I remember the uh, dormitory fire in Seton Hall. I mean, I grew up right down the, down the road from it. It was Mm -hmm. very upsetting and you were instrumental in requiring sprinklers in all dormitories and you know, you, you've done a lot of things looking at your record that really do resonate and really would hopefully, uh, you know, make people feel more confident in their government. But uh, let's look at, at the benefits that government employees get. Uh, things like lifetime taxpayer uh, health benefits, something that the average person has to kick and scream and hopefully get a job that pays for part of it. And those benefits have been declining. Government employees get Cadillac, as they call them. I would call them more Bentley uh, health benefits. Uh, The impossibility of firing incompetent government employees. It's it's all but impossible to do in many places. Uh, All of these things that really do undermine the faith of of the citizenry in their, their leaders. And, you know, it's, you've seen it so much in the pandemic where the leaders are saying, stay inside, stay inside, don't go out. And then you see them going out, getting haircuts, getting, uh, you know, visiting their leisure place, sending their relatives out of the state to Florida. I'm not going to name names, but we know this has happened. How can you expect the people to respect their leaders when you see this this utter hypocrisy and you also see what people perceive as authoritarianism in the name of trying to protect them and all of these things? I mean, it's really difficult to to see to really uh, accept this. Well, you know, I I think part of the problem uh, goes into our. I'll call it our national DNA. You know, remember that the North American continent that became the United States of America was settled by people who weren't fitting in well uh, <laughs> with the established order uh, in either England or you know France or Holland. Holland. Yeah, I couldn't you know, agree more. So, so we initially became the repository of the rebels. You know, the people who. Uh, had the temerity to believe they could worship as they chose and who wanted to say what they felt in their hearts, you know. And and that became part of our national DNA, but it also uh, creates a real difficulty when there's the need to engage in uh, very harsh collective actions like sheltering because we don't want to spread a virus that uh, has, you know, some alarming consequences. And so, you know, you, you start to see that, uh, you know, there's a kind of a tipping point for, for most Americans while they'll, they'll engage in that social order for a while. But after a time, that, that underpinning that, you know, is, goes back to the, the pilgrims and, you know, all of the original founders, they start to say, well, wait a minute. Uh, I'm done with this. I, I, <laughs> I want to live my life the way I want to. And, yeah. you know, that's, that's the tension that uh, is unique to America. You know, well, European nations 
uh, they seem to have a better tradition in saying somebody says stay inside, everybody stays inside, nobody asks questions. In the United States, somebody says stay inside, you stay inside for a month, and then people say, wait a minute, why am I doing this? Uh, and um, we certainly need leadership to be able to make that case. And I think one of the things that will come out of this pandemic is a a rearward assessment of where we were in January, both as a nation and as individual states. Um, Because I think that collectively, uh, while there were lots of professional warning signs by people who study disease and disease patterns to say, you know, there's something coming, uh, there wasn't a lot of collective government action. And I think, you know, it's part of the reason you had that 17% is that um, it's a tough thing to do. You know, you've got to tell people you can't do what you're used to doing. And so for as long as possible, government leaders on a variety of levels refrained from engaging in that conduct until it was inescapable that you needed to. Well, it's it's still debatable whether it was a success or not, because we looked at the states that were not locked down, Arkansas, South Dakota, and others. And when you adjust for population density and population, their results were no worse than any state that was locked down. So I think people right now, John, are doubting the efficacy of the complete government lockdown, shutdown. And the other thing is uh, what what used to be considered good government, perhaps back when people were coming to, to the United States, before it was the United States, to the colonies from England, now we consider to be sociopaths, sociopathic behavior. It's if I think the leaders said, look, we know this is a hardship. We know it's really going to stretch you and some businesses are not going to make it. And we'll do everything we can to help you. But this really is for the common good. But instead, what we have is, no, you're cutting hair, send out the uh, militia to shut them down. And this kind of heavy-handed authoritarian government response and the questionable constitutionality of these governor's acts is and it, it transcends political parties here, John. It's no, one party or the other. It's both. Well, I, I think, get it. You know, I think that more than anything. And then, like, let's look back and see. And then we see that the majority of cases, over two thirds, are contracted in the home. The number of cases that actually get transmitted out of doors, there's solid Chinese research, take it or leave it, that says it's a very infrequent thing to transmit uh, the coronavirus through uh, personal conduct outdoors. And our government just expects us to accept facts uh, because they say so. And the fact is, uh, oftentimes they've been wrong. Like, should you wear a mask or not? I still don't know the answer to that, but my gut feel is, you know, I'm in Florida here. And I'm not going to wear it unless a store says I got to wear it because there's no proof that it's going to be effective or not based on uh, our own uh, Center for Disease Control research. Well, I would disagree with you on that. I mean, I think there's there's an abundance of research. I think this is part of the danger in what's happening with the pandemic. Um, uh, These are are very complicated issues. And frankly, uh, while as a lawyer, I think I'm uh, pretty good at complicated issues, (laughs) I don't believe that I I have the ability to uh, second guess data coming from people who spend their entire lives learning and studying these issues. And for me, wearing a mask is not just about myself, but it's a sign of respect to other people because uh, I don't want them to be concerned that they may get something from me. So if I'm wearing a mask, I'm lessening the ability to transmit the little droplets that carry the coronavirus. Is it a perfect solution? No. Perfect solution would be for me to stay at home, I guess. But if I have to be out, uh, it's not just about my own protection, but it's about showing respect to the other people that Uh, I want to respect your ability to earn a living and be healthy. And if there's anything I may have I'm unaware of, 
I'm going to wear a mask. And I think that it's not a big deal. It's not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of, I think it's a sign of respect. But the, the difference between New York and New Jersey and Arkansas is that New York and New Jersey have four of the world's largest international airports in which people come and go. And uh, those populations coming and going uh, seeded the virus uh, in this area to a degree that couldn't even happen in Arkansas. And, 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 and this is the story of what happens with this type of information, is that we make uh, you know, inaccurate comparisons. As, as an assemblyman, I would always run into the person on the campaign trail who would talk to me about their brother-in-law or their cousin who lived in, you know, uh, Alabama or, or Tennessee, and they would talk about you know, the price of car insurance or the price of real estate taxes. And, you know, they're, they're very different states that offer very different services and have very different demographics. And, you know, yes. it's simple to say, you know, my brother-in-law lives in, uh, you know, Arkansas, and he, he pays $500 for car insurance, because likely... Uh, he lives in an area where, you know, he's more likely to hit a tree or a cow than he is another car. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, that factors into a lot of these things. And these are complicated issues. And, and mm-hmm. you know, we as Americans don't necessarily want to wait for the complicated answer. We just want it solved now. Well, I hear what you're saying. But we've known from the get-go, from the first outbreak in Washington State, that the people who are most vulnerable are the elderly. And they are the ones in most need of protection. And I'll give you two contrasts in states. New York uh, made the decision to ship off infected patients to nursing homes. And we've got over 10,000 deaths, probably close to 40% of the COVID-19 deaths elderly in nursing homes and long-term care facilities. Florida made the opposite decision, and there was 500 deaths there. New York has 19, almost 20 million people. Florida has almost 22 million And New Jersey made a similar decision and a little bit of empathy saying, hey, we thought we were doing the best that we could. We were wrong. We made a mistake. Uh, It's not going to make the people feel better who've lost uh, loved ones there, but it will perhaps uh, break down the distrust a bit for people feeling like their leaders are in it with them. Whereas in Pennsylvania, the head of the the head of the health department there uh, took his mother out of a personal care facility because knew, he knew it was coming. So I think when you see that type of thing, uh, people tend to doubt the whole thing. And the masks, we've heard Fauci say on one hand, masks don't bother. CDC, World Health Organization, don't bother. And now months later, after the thing has peaked and it's going down, there's still a debate about the masks and Like I say, uh, the people most likely to uh, get COVID-19 were the people who were least protected in most states. Well, what I'd like to talk about uh, before we conclude. So uh, you're thinking that uh, that the recent decision on Bridgegate has an impact as far as uh, General Flynn's case goes? Well, I think it is part of a series of Supreme Court decisions that, you know, ultimately I would expect that the Flynn case uh, could wind up in front of the United States Supreme Court. And, you know, the issue is one of what constitutes a, a valid prosecutorial act. Uh, the, the issue for General Flynn is, you know, not only those he charged with perjury, Lying to no, the he FBI. wasn't charged with perjury, charged with lying to the FBI, different causes. Uh, when you perjure yourself, you lie. Well, no, but you're lying under oath. When you lie to the FBI, you're not under oath, so it's There's not a perjury. Statute. There's a federal statute. I know, but it's not perjury. It's lying to the FBI. It, it criminalizes lying to the FBI. It um, criminalizes lying to the FBI. But the bottom line is this. He admitted to it twice. He said, I did it twice, under oath, twice. Right. Now, the Justice Department wants to say, never mind. When we talk about undermining faith in government, it works both ways, right? Mm. If, if you've prosecuted somebody and you've accepted a guilty plea twice, to now go backwards and say, 
oh, never mind. Well, it's not quite that simple, John. I mean, there is incredible corruption that was exposed in the Department of Justice. And there's all of this evidence that has been produced, John, evidence that they were out to get him, that they entrapped him, that they coerced his his confession through threatening his son with prosecution. And we've got uh, a couple of and they had to. had information uh, that would exonerate him, so-called Brady information, that his even his prior attorneys had requested numerous times. They requested the original 302, and we find out that that 302 disappeared, which is almost an impossibility in FBI record keeping. It did, and that uh, certain DOJ officials and FBI officials had had redacted and uh, edited his 302. And the fact is that regardless whether he made a plea or not, if the government had information that exonerated him, aren't they required to give it no matter what? FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Trilogy Metals is a world-class developer in Alaska's Ambler Mining District. The company already possesses 8 billion pounds of copper, 3 billion pounds of zinc, over 1 million gold equivalent ounces, and now over 77 million pounds of cobalt. Trilogy's Arctic project boasts an after-tax net present value of $1.4 billion with a 33% IRR. Trilogy is led by an experienced management team with proven success in discovering and developing projects in Alaska. The company is well capitalized, has no debt, and possesses strong institutional support. Trilogy trades on the New York and Toronto exchanges under the ticker symbol TMQ. To learn more, go to TrilogyMetals.com. That's TrilogyMetals.com. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. He admitted to lying, and he did in fact lie. They asked him a specific question. Actually, they gave him three opportunities in the interrogation to go back and correct what he had said. He said he and didn't he, remember. He didn't lie. No, 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 no. He lied. He deliberately lied. No, that's and it. What's more, what's more, he's given an opportunity in an allocution in court on a plea. He twice said yes. That's exactly what happened. Under coercion from the government. Under No, no. no from no, the uh, DOJ. Stand up in court. No, from the DOJ open court attorneys. In front of a judge, and the judge says... You're pleading guilty, Mr. Flynn, so let's talk about what you're pleading to. Whoa, 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 wait. So we have to go back. Where's the original 302, John? The original notes of the FBI interview. That doesn't matter? Well, if he is admitting to having lied. Oh, it matters when you've asked for it prior to your plea and the government has refused to provide it, which is clearly the case here. Then we get the notes. So it's from, okay, but but Terry, so what you're saying is it's okay to lie to the FBI. No, he didn't lie because the original 302, which were the the original notes of that interview, disappeared, and then a new 302 was created four months later. Comey so said he didn't would, lie. Why would General Flynn then say, yeah, I did lie. Because he was facing financial ruin. You know, the the government wins 99% of its cases. I mean, uh, for a democracy, that's pretty outrageous. And nobody can afford to take the government on uh, without, uh, you know, even no matter how much money you have, when the government comes after you, that's it for you. You're done. And people always take the plea. But when the government uh, doesn't release the Brady material prior to his plea, which we know happened here because they still, to this day, have not released the original 302, something stinks about this case. Bill Precepts... You and I are going to have to disagree well, on it. And let me just finish that Bill yeah. Precepts' uh, notes said, do we want to Do we want to get him to lie? Do we want to get him fired? Do we want to Do we want to try him, indict him? His own notes said it. So they were exactly. out to get this guy from no, the no, get-go. No, 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 Oh, yes. You see, but you see, here's the problem, and this is where I think this, this kind of discussion does a disservice to people's trust in government. It was a note about what, what is our agenda in this meeting. It wasn't saying, hey, we've got three choices here. It says, what is our agenda in this meeting? Yeah. Fire him, indict him, or exonerate him. 
I mean, that's you, you're not supposed to have an agenda when you go in. You're supposed to go for oh, the absolutely. facts you, and see where the well, facts no, no, no. lead you. What's the point? What's the point of the meeting? That was that, that no, was what no, the no, notes you're were. You're looking about. at it in a highly favorable light. And the fact is, look, well, but John, Harry, with, with respectfully, yeah. and you're looking at it in a, in a conspiratorial light. That absolutely, was because out to get it's him. clear. When it's you clear. lie, when you accede to the position of national security director. And you have lied to the FBI about your contacts with Russia prior to you getting that job. There is a real legitimate concern (laughs) that in your position, providing national security advice to the president of the United States, your position could be compromised because now the Russians have something on you. Look, I won't uh, dispute that other than the fact to say the guy is a war hero, three star general. He reported all of his contacts to the intelligence community when he had them with the guy. But we'll agree to disagree on that. But you got to admit something doesn't smell right when we've got uh, Stroke and uh, Page and all of these other people who've uh, either been fired or quit. And we got Comey in his own words saying he didn't think that General Flynn did anything wrong and committed no crime. And then you've got the government's refusal before the plea to release the 302, which they're required by law to do by Brady and by the rules of uh, criminal procedure, the federal rules of criminal procedure, they have to release all of their records to the defense. They never did it. So that makes this case exceptional. There's a national security exception that you're conveniently forgetting on that refusal to release. Uh, Not when it's exonerating the person and they didn't invoke the national security exception. They didn't say we can't give it to you because of national security. They just never gave it. They refused. So if they invoked it, then they would have to defend that action in court. But but, uh, General Flynn's attorneys asked for it multiple times. It's in the notes. And then Why General, hold it, hold it, hold it. And then General Flynn, because his attorneys told him to, and his attorneys had a conflict of interest because the uh, the uh, independent counsel's office, Mueller's office, threatened them for uh, for improperly filling out uh, FARA applications for General Flynn, and said that they were going to prosecute them, which they never disclosed to their client. So we've got like a really smelly, So General unseemly. Flynn's attorneys had a conflict of interest? Absolutely. They did because they were being threatened with prosecution by the same prosecutor who was already prosecuting their client. And they got out of it by getting General Flynn to plead guilty. That is like the ultimate conflict of interest. And now uh, you, you, you're right. You and I will have to disagree. You you consider General Flynn to be a, a war hero. I consider him to be a liar. Yeah, well, there's no shortage of lying that goes on in the government. And you know that. But the fact of the matter is that he was set up. But we'll agree to disagree. Um, hey, the Bridgegate thing. It's there probably was a crime committed here, but not under the statute that it was brought because the people didn't actually profit from it monetarily. But I agree well, with the, you. Here's the thing, Carrie, yeah. if you go to Judge Kagan's decision, you know, she, mm-hmm. she points out something very, it's kind of like the elephant in the room, so to speak. Judge Kagan cites the New Jersey statute that mm-hmm. far more appropriately fit the crime. Mm-hmm. Misuse of government authority. New Jersey has a statute on it. And, and Justice Kagan said that these are the kind of things that are more traditionally prosecuted at a state level. And so the, the, the question that she asked rhetorically, perhaps somewhat uh, covertly, was why didn't the New Jersey Attorney General prosecute the Bridgegate case? That's a good and question. The question is because Chris Christie didn't want his Attorney General prosecuting the Bridgegate case. Well, then it becomes a matter for the voters. But, you know, on the one hand, I understand the decision because there's so much corruption. Abuse of power is a slippery slope. But on the other hand, you know, 
like Fort Lee, having lived there for a couple of years, has got enough traffic. It doesn't need the governor's office adding to that traffic burden. It's a, it's a horrible thing to be stuck there in rush hour on a Friday evening. Although nowadays with the pandemic, we don't have to worry about such things. And now that New York City is all but shut down and will stay shut down for the indefinite future because the big companies are not reopening their offices in New York. So I agree with you, it's a corrupt use of power. But I also agree with Justice Kagan that uh, if money didn't pass, change hands, and there was no no reward for it, uh, you know, financial reward, then you got to think twice about it. And, but, uh, but in any event, I really do appreciate you coming on. And I do appreciate the work that you've done to, uh, to help protect, uh, you know, my former uh, home state, the state where I grew up in of New Jersey. I just remember that, uh, dormitory fire in Seton Hall and it was so unnecessary and terrible. easily terrible. prevented. And regardless how it happened, I th- seem to remember it was arson. Um, yeah, you know, it's one, one of the things is, you know, young college students, you know, they may be 18 years old, but they still sometimes think like children. <laughs> and uh, it was a, it was a prank. Uh, somebody wanted to light a sign on fire and had no conception of yeah. the consequences of doing that in an enclosed space. And, and unfortunately, people lost their lives because somebody thought this would be a fun prank to pull. Yeah. And, uh, well, kids are stupid, you know? Yeah. That's one constant that never changes. Kids are stupid. But, you know, whenever I go to a hotel or I'm staying any place away from my home, the first thing I do is look to see if there's sprinklers. And yeah. uh, if there are that immediately gives me reassurance, especially where there's stupid kids around. You want those sprinklers. Uh, it so happens in the home where I'm in, it was built a, a year and a half ago, two years ago. We have sprinklers here. Uh, well, you're very lucky. I mean, the, the one bit of fire safety advice is that uh, not only what you do in terms of looking to see if the building has fire suppression, look for the exits. Oh, a lot of times, I, <laughs> yeah. human nature is, human nature is, is you go out the exit you came in. Yeah. But oftentimes in a fire, there's an exit right next to you that you don't appreciate and uh, I know. You save your life. And I told my kids that I trained them from youth that I don't care. You go into a movie theater, any public place, I want you to immediately look for the fire exits. And uh, there have been clubs that I've walked out of, John, honestly, because I felt like if anything happens here, I'm dead man walking. I could never mm-hmm. get to that exit never get up those stairs, finished. And really, it's heartfelt thanks that uh, that you were in on that and helped lead the charge because public safety, that's the kind of thing that it's kind of like the dog that didn't bark. If I have a fire in my home tomorrow and the uh, sprinklers come on and put it out, you know, I, I don't think twice about it. I'm grateful the sprinklers were there, but I never think about the person who, like you, made sure that they were there. And I appreciate that. Really, no excuse for not being there. It's negligence not being there. But uh, but anyway, we do appreciate your service. And hey, I hope that you could be part of the solution, part of the increasing or turning those numbers around to 83 to 17, believing in government and understanding that partisan solutions are not going to change that. Only when we can concentrate on the things that we agree on and kind of put our disagreements aside, will that change? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, there has to be a realization that, um, you know, on both sides of the aisle, that there's nothing wrong with somebody having a liberal perspective. Uh, There's nothing wrong with someone having a conservative perspective. But what we have to recognize is that at the end of that process, we have to meld the conservative and the liberal into one policy. And that takes a word that sometimes is not very fashionable. It takes compromise. Absolutely. Like a marriage. 
right? You can't have right. a marriage without compromise, even if it means most of the time it's the uh, husband, uh, the male uh, doing what the wife wants. It's still compromise, right? <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I, in, 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 you know, in marriage is, you know, for me, I just say yes. Yeah. Hey, you know, the uh, four most uh, important words in a marriage. Sorry, honey, I was wrong. So <laughs> maybe that's five. <laughs> but you know what? Bringing a little bit of that over to the political realm really makes a lot of sense because we're in it together. We can't solve these problems from one party or the other. It's just not going to happen. And, uh, and most people aren't even a member of a party. That's the biggest party is no party affiliation. Why is that? So it's time to like put these things aside. Really do appreciate your coming on. Hey, where do we find out more about you, your website, connect with you on the web? Yeah, you, my, uh, my Twitter is uh, Wisniewski for New Jersey. Uh, and uh, I'm also on Facebook, uh, John Wisniewski. All right. And uh, folks can follow up with me that way. All right. Thank you so much, John. And any questions for John, myself, we'd love to hear from you. Email us, kl at kerrylutz.com, kl at kerrylutz.com. Go to the website, financialsurvivalnetwork.com. John, wish you the best of luck. Thanks so much for coming on. Good being with you. Thank you. Bye-bye. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. 